All right, John Morgan from the Pennsylvania Progressive. I'm here today with Eric Sarr. Eric is running for the Pennsylvania State House in the 129th District, correct? That's right. Uh, Eric is a U.S. Army veteran. Uh, he uh, was an Ar Arab Arabic linguist at Guantanamo Bay, and he's currently a consultant for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, tell us some about your background. You're originally from Scranton, and tell us a bit about that, where you went to school, and how you wound up in Sinking Spurt. Yeah, John, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me today. So, um, I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, as you mentioned. Um, went to King's College and graduated in 97. Uh, and my first job out of college, in fact, my job while I was going through college was uh, loading trucks at UPS. Um, learning the value of hard work, you know, sweating for a job, and paying my own way through college with the help of working at UPS and student loans. And uh, shortly after I got out of that job, I worked um, in a marketing position for UPS and joined the Army in uh, 1998. Uh, was living in Scranton, decided I wanted to get some new experiences in life, wanted to learn a foreign language, travel the world, and I enlisted in the Army to be an Arabic linguist and an intelligence um, analyst. And that was in 98. I spent about two years training, studying Arabic in California, and then having my intelligence training. And of course, um, shortly after I got out into the field in the Army and had a few assignments, 9-11 took place. And my career kind of took some drastic turns and really I had some experiences that profoundly impacted the way I view the world, what I want to do with my life, and my sense of service to country as well. And uh, your, your wife, Darcy, is from West Lawn, right. and that's how you wound up in the Reading area in Berks County, correct? Right. That's right. So towards the end of my time in the Army in 2004, um, Darcy and I met through mutual friends. Um, who actually lived at the here beach. also in Sinkspring. <laughs> right, right, at the beach. The friends who were getting married, actually, both of our best friends. And uh, we started dating at the end of my time in the Army. She was living in uh, Washington, D.C., and I was living in Maryland. Uh, I was working at Fort Meade at the National Security Agency. Um, and I'll tell you, we decided once we got married and we're living for a year outside of D.C. and Virginia, um, we started thinking about having a family and settling down and of course I was from Scranton from Pennsylvania Darcy was from here in Berks County. She had been a Wilson school teacher um, for six years I believe before she moved to, um, to Virginia and we realized what we wanted for our family was kind of the lifestyle and the values that we think are embodied here in Berks County so that's why we, we moved back in 2005 and have been here since. Um, and you have two boys now? I have two boys. Uh, Griffin is five years old. And Jasper is two, just about to turn three. And they keep us uh, busy and very happy. And, but you wind up uh, residing in a, a very Republican part of the county. <laughs> we did. We did. You know, when we, uh, when we chose to, uh, to move and settle, we, we chose uh, the Wilson School District for the quality of education. But we also came back to Berks because of the things we think make the community strong, a strong uh, sense of common sense, uh, concern for your neighbor, um, the opportunity to work hard and get ahead. We thought that was something that was, that was, uh, that was here and present for our kids, so that's why we, we moved back. But you work in D.C.? I work a little bit at home and some in, in, in D.C. I work um, I, for a, quite a while after I got out of the Army, I worked as a counterterrorism analyst um, for different assignments associated with the Defense Department as a consultant. And I now work as a, as a consultant to the Office of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon. So I'm there a few days a week. I'm home a few days a week. Um, it's exciting work. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to do it and be around senior Defense Department officials um, and see kind of their leadership style have an impact on um, what operations go on there at the, at the Joint Staff. And, um, but I'm excited about this opportunity now as, as well. Well, it, it seems to be a pretty good resume if you're running in a heavily Republican district, which the 29th traditionally has been. Uh, the incumbent there is uh, Representative Jim Cox. Uh, he has an interesting biography uh, and an interesting voting record in Harrisburg. Um, he is not from Pennsylvania, but uh, he came here to work for Sam Wuerr. He got his degree from a Christian college in Florida, which isn't even accredited. He went to law school at 
Pat Robertson's Regent University. From there he went to work for the Rutherford Institute, which is a kind of a think tank for the far right Christian fundamentalists. Then he went to work for Sam Orr, who is a radical Christian fundamentalist, uh, before running for state house. That pretty much is his biography. I'll tell you, John, the, uh, one of the reasons you know, the, we decided to. I decided to run for this seat is because the values I re I mentioned that I feel make this community so strong aren't represented in Harrisburg, and they're not represented by Representative Cox, in my opinion, at all. And you mentioned kind of some of his experiences, and I'll tell you, uh, you know, the contrast between Representative Cox and myself is sharp, and I and it's and it's sharp in the sense that you know. Sometimes in the Republican and Democratic divide, we kind of push things to, uh, you know, religion on one side and secularism on the other side. I will tell you very strongly that my faith is one of the reasons I'm running for this seat because I, uh, I think it's wrong what's happened to Christianity in the public square or really faith in the public square. And this is some of the things you described in his experiences and the connection to the places that he votes, that he votes to defund public education, that he votes to, uh, you know, as no support at all for government services, as basic as building an infrastructure to help our economy. And his views are somehow tied to an ideology that's close, that's associated with um, a perspective of faith, to me is antithetical to the faith I have. Um, and it's, and, and most importantly, it's the, the wrong things for our community. Well, it seems to me that Christianity is about loving people. It's about uh, helping the downtrodden, feeding the poor, clothing people, you know, housing, make, making sure the unfortunate are taken care of. But too many of these people who call themselves fundamentalist evangelical Christians don't believe in any of that. Well, I'll tell you, John, the... The, my sense of our community uh, is that his views are out of step with the concerns of our, of our community in the way I do think our, our community represents folks who care about their neighbors. You know, Darcy and I <clears throat> moved back here, like I said, because of what we felt strongly about in the sense of community. Last summer, um, Darcy was an athlete at Penn State and had numerous knee surgeries, and she was actually in need of, of another one. She was a soccer player, and we had, um, she, uh, she had ACL surgery while well, I still traveled a lot for work. Our neighbors and our friends and our community made meals for us. They, you know, they scheduled times to take our kids when my wife was in bed and couldn't get out and, and did things you know, for our family and took people places while I was gone. <clears throat> they did what neighbors do when right. you care about each other. It takes a community. It take, right, and, and I'll tell you, you know, we, we live of course, the 129th does not represent the city of Reading, but it's just outside the city of Reading. And the fact that Reading was named the poorest city in the country in the, from the data from the last census, you know, we're the, those are our neighbors. You know, we need to, first of all, economically, that has a broad impact on our community, our county as a whole, or really the whole region. Yes. Um, but uh, on a second level, you know, we have to look and say, what is the responsibility of a neighbor to help um, look to see what policies or what things can be done to help solve those, those challenges in Reading. Um, Has Jim Cox done anything for the city of Reading that you know of that's positive or constructive? Well, I'll tell you, John, the easiest thing to do is to look at Jim's voting record, right? I mean, <clears throat> the city of Reading has a, a school budget shortfall of nearly $50 million. Yesterday, or two days ago, they talked about possibly cutting 170 teachers. Now these are things that closing have, four schools. Closing schools, right? These are things that have impact on on our community as a whole. Now, what, what you asked, what has Jim done in terms of helping the city of Reading? Well, you know, it's helping our community as a whole on one sense, but helping Reading also. Well, the thing is, you know, Jim supports uh, actually higher property taxes because he's cutting funding for schools across the state right. supported the government. Which is driving up the local property course, taxes. Direct impact on private taxes. So a worse a worsening effect on the, the price of the value of a home because his plan that he recently proposed which would you know drive up prices of groceries and
business services throughout the community, while really not eliminating school property taxes, but more, most importantly, will defund our schools and hurt property values and the economy as a whole. So these are things that are sharp contrast between what Jim represents and what I intend to represent. And you're talking about his House Bill 1776, which would raise the sales tax, which is a very regressive tax, because the lower your income, the higher percentage of your income you pay. Um, and, and he would extend it to many other uh, uh, items, including even coffins. So it would actually be a debt tax. Right, right. And I'll tell you, John, it's not... Um, one of the things that makes this a challenging issue to discuss is, you know, you tell a homeowner, hey, I'm going to take away your school property tax and you're just going to pay a few bucks more for groceries. And then, you know, people say, hey, that sounds like a great plan. But it's really the devil's in the details. And what this plan really amounts to is, first of all, let me be very clear, there is a, a problem with high property taxes in Pennsylvania. And there are better ways to do business. And the fact, and I will actually argue that the fact that he has chosen to spend, he and actually Sam Rourke, have taken 20 years to basically recycle the same plan over and over and over again, actually diminishes their capacity to really solve the problem, right? It's a real problem that has to be solved. There's alternative solutions to reform the property tax code and to for provide for new revenue sources. But his plan is bad for business, it's bad for families, and it's bad for schools. Um, in the long run, what they're, they're not telling you in a plan that really does not eliminate property taxes because it allows the school board to continue the property tax. It also gives the school board the ability to, to tax your income, which the school board does not now have. And of course, as you mentioned, the regressive aspect of the tax is horrible for it would only worsen the, the poverty okay. problem we have right now right. in our community. Yeah, people who already can't afford to eat, who are going hungry, would find their cost of groceries going up even more. And, and the notion, you know, you hear the rhetoric from the other side on this issue to say, well, this is going to make a broader tax pool that's going to spread the burden because there's all these folks who supposedly aren't paying into the property tax system. Basically, they're trying to tell you that renters aren't paying into the property tax system. But they right? do. The landlord will tell you yes. that they're going to calculate their, their property tax, their, their rent based that on they the charge based tax. on what their property tax is. Yes, the property taxes go up for their investments they raise their rents to cover that. I mean, John, probably the, one of the best ways to look at this in the Wilson School District where I reside, you know, we have a large mall that helps really yes. contribute to the school district's property tax. The but they would, be, they would be paying property right. tax they would, anymore. We would lose that revenue and that would be replaced on the backs of middle class families and working families and it's the wrong answer for a real challenge that we have. That's what I said. I mean, he doesn't actually broaden the tax base at all because by eliminating school property taxes, you're relieving all businesses of that investment in their community. Right. So in your case, all those commercial areas uh, in Spring Township, right. all the big box stores, shopping centers, yeah. malls, they no longer pay school property taxes under his plan. Right. Right. And that's, it's, it's bad for the community. It's, it's very bad for our school system, you know. One thing I think to look at is what, you know, how do different constituencies feel about this, right? So how does the business community feel about this? How do homeowners feel? How do the, the working poor and the poor advocates feel about this? And really, in, in, across the spectrum, there are constituencies that think this is a bad idea. The school boards will actually tell you, you know, they recognize that primarily being funded by property tax alone is a poor alternative. And I agree with that assessment. There should be a broader tax base other than just the property tax. And I will tell you, my first priority in terms of addressing this issue is the fact that we have senior citizens who've contributed so much to their community, they've owned their home for years, and now their kids are long gone and they're in the community and they're forced to pay rising, rising property taxes year after year. And that can be addressed. You know, there's issues we can we can eliminate property taxes for senior citizens who've owned their home for X number of years. You know, and there are revenue sources to get these things. But when you tie yourself to one plan for 20 years and say it's my way or the highway, somehow that just has no common sense. And I'll tell you, it's antithetical to the common sense values of the people in this community. Well, and to uh, kind of go into uh, another area here, uh, Cox was chief of staff to state representative Sam Orr before he ran for this seat. 
in that capacity, he drafted a letter to a judge in Chester County arguing that the state has no right to issue driver's licenses or require them. But at the same time, he's an advocate for voter ID, which requires every voter to have a state-issued ID. Mm -hmm. uh, you've, you've called for a number of debates mm -hmm. uh, with Mr. Cox. Uh, how do you think he would reconcile all those positions? Well, he's ignored my challenges to debates, as you know, John. But uh, I don't think he wants to talk to the community. You know, I've been actively knocking on doors. I plan to do it this summer. I plan to work real hard to, to get out and meet folks, find out their concerns about the community. And I will tell you, uh, I think Jim is far out of step with the values of both Republicans, Democrats, and independents in this community. The notion that the state should have no right to ask someone for a driver's license. Again, you know, the, these, we live in a place where folks have common sense, smacks of no common sense whatsoever, right? Um, and and should you, drivers know what the traffic laws are and, and, and should know the basic rules of the road, which are required to get a driver's license? Uh, right. How would somebody not appreciate that? Right. And, and, and it fundamentally, I think, goes to the core. I really do want to talk to Jim and have this conversation. The public deserves to know. What is your view of what actually the government should and shouldn't do? You know, it's easy for them to throw a lot, throw out, you know, big government, big spenders, those people on the other side. It's it's not the case. What we really want to have a discussion about: Should government repair roads and bridges? Should government make for a safe community and have cops on the streets? Look, those are things that people don't look and say, "Oh, that's a big government idea." No, that's what makes our community strong and safe. Right, and I will tell you, I want to talk to Jim because I think, at his core, he will probably tell you no. The government should do those things, um, and that's a message I think that people need to have this clear contrast between uh, what Jim stands for and what I stand for in this election, and it's a sharp difference. Well, uh, another issue that is probably going to come up in, in this race is uh, puppies. Uh, it turns out that uh, Representative Cox has a rather bad voting record when it comes to protecting puppies. Uh, Pennsylvania is, is a major puppy mill state. It's a, it's a real stain on our reputation. Uh, and you know, bills have come up in Harrisburg to regulate these puppy mills. And Jim Cox is against the state regulating these puppy mills. Right, and I'll tell you, Again, John, this is another issue of common sense and out of step with the values of our community. Uh, representative Cox was one of only 17 representatives to vote against the common sense legislation in 2008 that Governor Rendell put in to help solve some of the, the problems that made us a puppy mill factory, right? It was not a Republican or Democratic issue. Everyone agreed we have a challenge. Let's look at some common sense solutions to solve it. There are 203 representatives in Harrisburg in the House of Representatives, Jim was one of 17 to vote against it. Not only did he vote against basic things like, you know, safe conditions for puppies, so, you know, and, and common sense legislation, he also introduced in 2011 in his committee uh, legislation to overturn or talked about overturning that, those rules. Um, so he's out of step with kind of the basic, basic common sense values of this community. And I mean, when we're talking about puppy mills, let's you know, really give a realistic picture to people what they are. These dogs are kept in small cages their entire lives, not even a floor. Um, and all they're done, used for is breeding, one litter after another after another. Uh, and a lot of times the puppies that come out of these are unhealthy because they're coming out of unhealthy situations. Mm -hmm. uh, these puppies are sold to, to pet stores all you know across the region and all that and consumers get stuck with sick dogs. And also John it's important to note some of these puppies end up being so sick or, or folks can't take care of them so they end up in shelters right? Yeah. So you would think uh, you know Representative Cox has said it's for lower taxes he thinks the tax burden is high as do I in Pennsylvania. So recently there's common sense legislation put forward that says, look, we recognize we have this puppy mill problem in Pennsylvania. 
sometimes when folks take on a, a dog from a shelter, they have a lot of medical costs, but they want to care for the dog. So let's give them a tax credit. So there was a bill introduced last month that said, let's give them a $300 tax credit. Not a lot of money, small, a small amount of money in the big picture of the state budget. Jim voted against the tax credit for middle class families that adopt puppies. I mean, from shelters, yeah. From shelters, yes. exactly. Right, right, only from shelters, right? Yeah. Not for all pet owners, right. for troubled dogs from shelters. Let's give them a tax credit. Jim said that. And, and this would be a huge help for the animal shelters who are right. really burdened with picking up strays and taking it abandoned uh, animals. And a lot of times, you know, a, a family buys one of these puppies from you know, what turns out to be a puppy mill, and, and the animal's very sick, and they just can't afford to take care of the animal, so they take them to the shelter. Right, right. Um, and, the, and again, it's, it's, it's a common sense issue that says, how can you on one hand say that you're for lower taxes, that you believe that, you know, families are burdened with high taxes in Pennsylvania and they need to be lowered as they, as they, they should be in a lot of instances, and then on the other hand, vote against a common sense tax credit for folks helping Helping uh, trouble dogs and and our and our important institutions in the state. Well, how do you intend to win this seat? Uh, what what other issues are important to you that you think are important yeah. in this election? And thanks for asking, that, John. For the, for the first intention is to work very hard to shake as many hands and talk to as many voters as I can. Um, I encourage voters or folks interested in our campaign to go to voteericsar.com. Uh, follow us on Facebook and, and get updates on the campaign. But there are three, three or four issues that will probably be the most central issues of this campaign. And we mentioned a few of them already. Number one is the local economy. Um, what do we do to spark the local economy? How do we work collaboratively across Republican and Democratic lines to say what can we do to solve some of those things? And there's a, there's a number of issues, but I'll tell you two closely related issues that what I think we need to do for employers to grow and for employees to have opportunity. Uh, one, we have a crumbling infrastructure. We talk about it all the time in Pennsylvania um, and nothing has been done. And recently, I think two days ago, the Lehigh Valley Chamber of Commerce called on the governor to fix the roads, get, get a transportation infrastructure plan together. Two years, no action. Jim's been silent on this issue. Nothing to help the businesses of, of uh, Pennsylvania, Berks County, that suffer because of our crumbling infrastructure. We create jobs. It would help folks um, in a lot of different ways in our local economy. That's one thing. Number two, um, what do you, what do I get when I go to employers and say, what do you need to grow your business? So you want, we want to help employers grow, and we want to help workers have opportunities. So what do employers need? Right? They need over and over again. I've heard the same thing. I need an educated workforce. You know, we still have manufacturing jobs in Berks County, but the the nature of manufacturing has changed. It is you know, much more technical. People need to have a greater skill set. So how do you say you're gonna help the local economy um, and you care about the local economy, but you uh, support higher costs of college education, defunding public education, fail to support these important programs that tie the skills that employers need with the skills that need to be developed in, in workers so they themselves can have opportunity as well. Um, other issues that I think are important to this are reforming Harrisburg, right? So since 2006, when there was this late night pay raise and then the corruption investigations that followed with both Republicans and Democrats, the measures that have been put in place thus far were really half measures to just appease some voters and thinking, you know, these guys in Harrisburg, Republicans and Democrats think that they just let this go, voters will forget. Well, I'm here to tell you that I think voters still want reform they want a smaller legislature. They definitely want a more transparent legislature, one where there's campaign finance reform, so you can't be funded by just a few real wealthy individuals, but have to kind of go around and have transparency in that. They want change in that regard. And then the last thing, of course, is, is our education system. Um, it's impossible for us to think we could transform our community and be ready for a 21st century economy when we worsen the education system in our community. Um, there's no better way to prepare young people and frankly to protect the value of our property and our community other than to have strong schools. Um, those are the things I'm going to fight for. Good, good. You mentioned campaign finance reform. That's been a, a, a pet subject of mine over the years. I know you've been a long time reader of my blog and all that. Um, 
So you, you know I'm, I'm often pontificating about campaign finance reform. Uh, and you know, when I go through campaign finance reports, the things I see shock me. Mm -hmm. um, the law says in Pennsylvania that all money raised for a campaign should be used to influence the outcome of an election. Yet we go through these campaign finance reports and the things you see are just you know, surprising, but part of it is there's no real enforcement. Unless somebody actually files a complaint about you know, use of funds or something, nothing's ever done in Harrisburg. Jim Cox is one example. After he was first elected, he went out and used his campaign money to buy five suits. And it's ironic because he's yet to fill any of them. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, John, it's indicative really to me of, again, how out of touch he is with the voters in this community. But more importantly, or just as important, I should say, is his perspective on how to use other people's money, right? Uh, you mentioned in his 2006 campaign finance report, he bought himself some suits, right? He recently, at a time when, you know, cops, nurses, firefighters are all taking a pay freeze, he recently said, you know, I, I'm, while other legislators said they're either going to give their money to charity or give it back to the state of Pennsylvania when their automatic pay raise comes every year, uh, Jim, of course, said he was going to keep his. Um, and then, you know, the example we talked about with the tax cut for for puppies, you know, Representative Cox wants to pretend that he is a, a, an advocate for the taxpayer, but all you need to do is look at how he spends other people's money and get a sense of where he is on that issue. Why do you think he hates puppies? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm a pet owner myself. I have two pugs. It's hard to relate, you know. And I'll tell you, going to door to door in our community, knocking on Republicans' doors, Democrats' doors, uh, independence, you find puppy owners everywhere, so I don't know why you'd want to kind of take that stance. <laughs> All right, is there anything else you'd like to add uh, for the voters? Uh, I'll tell you, John, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for, uh, for hosting me and, uh, and for this interview. Um, I will just tell you, you know, you have to ask yourself when you're going to do this, and you get asked by all sorts of people, why do you, why do you want to do something like this? And uh, um, my mother once said to me, you know, at one point in your life you were going to be a minister, then you were going to be a soldier, and now you tell me you're running for to be a politician. What happened to you, right? <laughs> and people have this tremendous sense of how broken our political system is. Um, and to me, that actually motivates me to want to be involved more. You know, when my wife and I moved back here and we saw, you know, we moved here because of the values that are represented here, and we have been thrilled with our neighbors, our community, the strength of the schools that we're going to send our children to. Um, but I'll tell you, those values are undermined in Harrisburg every day. And they really are, and uh, there's an absence of common sense there. And that's what drives me to get into this race. Um, and it's because I want a community that continues to be strong, improves where it needs to be improved, um, and a place where I can be proud to call home. And that's why I'm running. And that's really the message I want to get across. All right, so essentially Eric Saar is the common sense candidate for the 129th. Right. All right, well, thank you very much, Eric. Thanks, John.